I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange. Symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Keith Schaefer, editor and publisher of the Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin, the website oilandgas-investments.com. Keith, welcome back to the show. Jim, thanks for having me. The Federal Court of Appeal has ruled two to one that the Northern Gateway Pipeline approval is now disapproved, basically because they didn't consult adequately with the First Nations involved with the project. And now it's up to the federal cabinet to decide where it goes after this. After all, Prime Minister Harper, when he was in, passed a law saying the federal cabinet can overrule any National Energy Board decision. However, I don't think they can overrule the courts. So what this really does is create another ball of confusion for the industry, doesn't it? Yeah, the industry has, has had the goalpost moved all the time, and uh, like I've said many times, the industry has done whatever they can to shoot themselves in the foot as hard as possible. Uh, they, they just really missed the boat completely on the tide, the turn in the tide of public opinion, and uh, now they're paying the price. Is this going to mean Canada is out of the international energy business, or has that business radically changed in the last year or so? Well, I think when this issue was was such a big media thing was when the difference between Brent and WTI was ten to fifteen dollars, and now it's only a few pennies. So uh, I, I don't think it's near as big a deal as it used to be. Uh, so in one sense, you could argue now it's a tempest in a teapot, but um, it would still mean a little bit incremental money for the United, for the Canadian industry if they were allowed to have a diversity of customers. Getting on to inventories, U.S. oil inventories are going down very slowly, but is that the right metric to look at? Are they the most transparent and biggest of oil flows so far? Well, yeah, I think for all the the bull's arguments that oil is going higher, the number one argument has been, well, U.S. oil inventories are going down very, very slowly. And... Uh, I, I think that um, that that might not be the best metric to look at, simply because the U.S. being you know a free the best free market economy in the world, they it's very entrepreneurial. They're able to build storage here, so we've got a lot more storage than we did even two three years ago when this was again an issue. So we've built a lot of storage. So the world is still producing a lot of oil, and they're just bringing it here. To store because it's like you say it, you have Anglo-Saxon rule of law here. You've got um, you know increasing amounts of storage, so storage is cheaper here than anywhere else in the world. So this is kind of like the, the, the just much like the U.S. dollar is in the currency markets. The U.S. is the last big safe haven for oil storage. So it, as opposed to it being a, a leading indicator, I think there's a pretty strong argument it's actually a lagging indicator. And for people who keep their eye on on that, saying, "Hey, the uh, life isn't so great in the oil market," I think they might be missing some of the other signs that are out there, because there's so much international production floating over here to get stored. Really, it it, it when you see declining inventories here, I, I'm going to suggest that that probably means that um, inventories in other parts of the world have been drawn down first. Now, the problem with that, of course, Jim, is that the rest of the world is very opaque, and it's tough to get a handle on what oil is being stored where with any kind of great degree of credibility. So everything that I'm reading suggests that 
the international inventories are not declining. So uh, I, I don't think we're really in worry yet of, of seeing oil jump to 60 bucks or anything. But um, for those who are keeping their eyes strictly on U.S. oil inventories, I, I, I think they would end up being a, missing a lot of the price rise in oil in advance of those inventories dropping. Is there a feeling that prices are, are going to remain in the 48 to $50 range for quite some time? Oh, Jim, trust me, the, uh, across the board, there is no greater consensus on oil now than there has been for the last two years. You hear so many people saying we're going to be at 80 bucks by the end of 16, and people saying, oh, no, the, the high for the year has been set here, uh, the, we're, we're done. It's not going to backfill very much, but it's, it's we're, we're done. So it's like, and, and these are all well-respected groups and people around the world with lots of credibility, history, and letters behind their name, and there really is no consensus. I, I think the, the, the big thing, Jim, is that uh, product demand continues to impress. Uh, at the same time, production has continued to impress. So, uh, you know, again, we're just not eating away at these inventories very much. It's it's tough to see $60 oil this year at, at this juncture, in my opinion. The presidents of the U.S., Mexico, and Canada's prime minister say they want to see 50% sustainable energy within nine years. Is that a doable goal? No way. Not a chance. Not a hope. There's absolutely no way they're ever going to be able to do that. You know, you're, you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of all fossil fuels, which are like 75 to 80 percent. You know, certainly wind and um, solar are moving up really fast, but they're from such small bases, Jim. And uh, the only true baseload power you can have is uh, that, that that's renewable is geothermal. And, and there's just no way. If they want to lump uranium into that, which I would disagree with hardly as, as a renewable, then um, they might be able to, to to meet that goal, but honestly, uh, that's just a such an empty pipe dream. It's laughable. So it's a political goal, and it sounds great right now, but not really practical. No, they they, they should have waited till they were close to an election to spew that stuff. <laughs> and of course, too, if there was a radical switch to electric cars right now, would we have the electrical resources to charge all of them? Yeah, you know what? Uh, that's a great question. The short answer is n- n- nobody knows, but I would say that you know electricity prices have declined forty percent in the last several years. So uh, the industry has obviously got very efficient with rising commodity prices. So um, oil, that is. Though I guess you could argue that most of electricity comes from coal and natural gas, and both those commodities have been in quite a um, bear market for the last four years. So. Uh, could the U.S. population pay a lot more for electricity if, if demand soared? I, I think they could. Uh, is that even remotely plausible? No. Again, because Jim, all, all this all this electricity comes from coal and natural gas. Seventy over seventy percent, almost eighty percent, comes from the dynamic duo of coal and natural gas. So all you've done then is remove the pollution from the city and put it to wherever the plant is. Yeah, you're you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Natural gas prices, I've noticed, have been rising at least slightly, whereas gasoline prices lately have dropped a bit. Is natural gas gaining favor again? Oh, for electricity, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, forget transportation. That that's not going to be an issue in our lifetime, maybe our kids' lifetime. But um, the the reality is that uh, you know weather is what moves natural gas prices. And so there has been a good increase in structural demand, so power generation and uh, industrial, but, uh, but in residential consumer uh, markets, which is at the margin here, that that's done by weather. And we've had a, quite a hot June, much hotter than expected. So that's really what's driven prices. But the other big thing, Jim, that's happening here is the, finally the mighty Marcellus. The, the big formation in Virginia and, and um, in West Virginia and, and Pennsylvania that has just gone from like two to twenty BCF a day in the last ten years, and you think that the U.S. produces about seventy-two BCF now, and the, the the without the Marcellus going from two to twenty, just think where gas prices would be. It'd be a hell of a lot higher, but it's finally peaking. It, it, it's been flat for about six to nine months now, and that has a lot of people thinking that. Um, North America's natural gas production is finally 
rolling over. And certainly, each week we're seeing the amount of natural gas injected into underwater, or sorry, underground caverns, so into storage, is down about three to three and a half billion cubic feet a day. So about 25 BCF a week. So that's uh, th- that, that's a quite a tightening in the market. So when, you, when you're three to three and a half bees. Uh, a, a day tighter than last year. That's that's a lot. So uh, I, I think that's why we're seeing gas prices uh, go quite a bit higher. And certainly, when we saw earlier this week, there was a gas explosion at, uh, at a pretty big Mississippi uh, state of Mississippi gas plant, and uh, gas ripped like twenty cents a gigajoule higher. Like that's that kind of knee jerk reaction just speaks so loudly that this market is bullish. Like if if that would have been a flat price move, no, if there would have been no movement there, w- wouldn't have been a big deal. But the market is clearly fearful. We'll have more with Keith Schaefer right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange. Symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Keith Schaefer. Keith, are there any other energy concerns that we should be looking at right now? Uh, I know Nigeria has been a problem. Libya not so hot. Are they cooling off now? Uh, you know, you know, Jim, I haven't kept real close tabs on what's going on in Nigeria. Obviously, it sounds like you've got a relatively dedicated uh, splinter group there wanting to see more of the oil revenue uh, go to Nigeria. And um, they, they think that the majors are the cause of the problem there, and that could easily be. I, 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 I just have no concept of how the oil market works there. Certainly, oil has been a curse to many poverty-stricken third-world countries when you think it should be an absolute bona fide boon, where, uh, boom where everybody's making lots of money and money flow goes great. I don't understand why in Africa uh, you're seeing just a, whenever oil gets discovered there, sadly, the quality of living seems to go down for these people and that just makes no sense whatsoever well yes when the president's daughter of so many countries is the richest woman and it's all in oil how did she get that oil did she go out and discover it most unlikely is that one of the frustrations with international oil markets you know what's happening in canada and the u.s the industry reports very clearly and and promptly when you look at other nations confusion yeah, I, I, if I knew the answer to that, Jim, I, I, I'd be the UN Secretary General. <laughs> I, I have no idea. It's just, just, but it is sad to watch from the outside where all these um, countries that are blessed with great natural resources aren't able to spread the benefits to the people. Inventories for ethanol are going down. Is that serious? Well, uh, well, well, you know, ethanol is such an interesting market because it's, it's not well followed, and uh, you know, it's gasoline made from corn. And up here in Canada, we don't have any ethanol stocks. We we, we do produce ethanol, but really, the the U.S. has their, their economies of scale have basically drowned out anything in Canada. So there's no, I don't even think there's any Canadian stocks with exposure to ethanol. It's just all in private companies. So, you know, what we're seeing, but but ethanol is where I made the most money in my subscribers history back in 2013 and 2014 when when ethanol went from basically negative margins to two bucks a gallon margin in five months so these stocks just went crazy one of them great green plains went from nine to forty five and well that's when we caught it but it actually went from four to forty five and then uh, pacific ethanol went from three to twenty three so in in just nine months so that there's fantastic 
profits to be made on these small cap ethanol plays down in the states. But um, what we're seeing right now, and what I just alerted to subscribers today, was that you know RIN prices are moving up, and what what RINs are are renewable identification numbers, and what the U.S. government's done is uh, it, it it forces the industry to put a number on every single gallon of ethanol ever produced, and and the refiners have to account for that because there's a law in the state that says you have to use 10% of ethanol in all your gasoline. Now, the oil industry doesn't like that because it takes away their market share, but they don't have a lot of choice. So if they don't use 10%, Jim, they have to buy one of these RINs uh, to make up for it. And so when the price of RINs goes high, it means the industry is thinking it will be short ethanol at some point. And RIN prices have gone up about 30% in the last uh, month and a half from about 70 to 95 cents a gallon, which really hurts the independent refiners down in the states who aren't integrated and produce their own fuel. So but it's also very positive for the ethanol producers because it, it generally, le higher RIN prices generally lead to higher profitability, maybe not immediately, uh, but certainly within the next 18 months, it's a very bullish sign. It's kind of the canary in the coal mine. The profitability for the ethanol industry is going to be higher, higher. So right now, because we follow it in these stocks, generally all have quite small floats. They're quite volatile, and if you know how to trade those, you can make a lot of money. So I've been telling subscribers the last little while that it's time to get back into some of these ethanol stocks. I don't think we're going to have quite the same run that we did in 2013 and 2014 when these things went up five times in a year. But uh, I, I think there's a, enough capital gains potential on the table to warrant looking at this sector again. Keith, anything else you want to mention today? Jim, I think we covered it all. It's Canada Day weekend. Let's let people get back to their uh, their gin and tonics. Yes, uh, happy Canada Day, and to our American listeners, happy Independence Day. Absolutely, Jim. God bless. My guest has been Keith Schaefer, editor and publisher of the Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin, his website, oilandgas-investments.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. If you have any questions for the show, our email address is info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.